Welcome to Unrestrain, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations where professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. Hello and welcome to Unrestrained, a CPI podcast series. This is your host, Terry Vitone, and today I'm joined by Stan Granger. He is a youth center supervisor at the Ingham County Youth Center in Lansing, Michigan. Hello and welcome, Stan. Good morning. How are you, everyone? Good morning. I'm doing great. Thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Uh, Stan Granger has been working for the Ingham County Circuit Court Family Division for over two decades. He was a juvenile court officer from 1998 until March 2006. And from mid-2006 to the present, he has been the Youth Center Supervisor for the Ingham County Youth Center. That's a secure youth correction facility. He holds a BA in sociology with a concentration on criminal justice from Central Michigan University. Stan is a CPI master level certified instructor. And much of our interview today will concern how CPI training and techniques have helped to achieve lasting and positive culture change at the facility. All right, Stan, let's begin today by having you talk about the facility and the population you serve. Um, if you would describe the Ingham County Youth Center for our listeners. Well, we're, we're a 24-bed secure facility. We're a short-term detention center, which is a little different than a long care treat, uh, long, excuse, long-term treatment. But, uh, you know, where our doors are constantly revolving, you know, our average length of stay is 14 days. Uh, we get everybody from uh, minor probation violations to murder cases to traffic cases. Um, we have I, our population is, is very diverse. Every day it changes. I could have seven leave tomorrow. And six come in this afternoon. And we never know what we're running into from day to day. So it's an ever revolving. And what's the age range of the boys uh, and girls? Age range is technically anybody under the age of seventeen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we do get an occasional younger individual, a ten, um, but those are some very extreme cases. Um, and usually, the community wraps enough services around that they they do their best to kind of divert them from detention facility. I see. All right. And to, uh, so you started there in 2006. And I'm wondering, was CPI training in place then? I know you had your first training, I believe, in 1995. Yeah. I, you know, uh, the CPI, CPI was in place prior to me being involved. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, you know, I, and we speak about prior to, uh, like, the, the, um, my experience coming here, it was like we have a formal training process. Um, but this is kind of how we really handle things. And, and so it really bothered me. Uh, and so that was one of my uh, items that we went after when I started. I see. And I, I, I read, read here that you, uh, that the youth center incorporates cognitive behavior, uh, thera- therapy programming and practices for at risk youth. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. CDT is, uh, um, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, beha- it's, it's a behavioral response program as opposed to, um, we do a lot of encouragement in regards to allowing kids to make their decisions, um, and, and but holding them accountable in regards to how they do it. It's not a punitive based system. It is it is working with the social skills, working with outcomes, getting kids to understand that yes, every decision we make uh, is uh, has a good and negative response. And so we spend a lot of time talking about restorative justice. And connecting the kids with with the, with the victims that there's something within the facility that happens obviously this is some bigger stuff but understanding that you know their thoughts and irrational beliefs and and their feelings and experiences have, have molded them to a certain way and so we have to spend time kind of reprogramming those thoughts and there's what we have hot thoughts where kids get really angry really fast and they have these impulsive really unfortunately bad thoughts and and we have to talk about how and work through changing that to cold thoughts and, and getting them calm and, and helping them make rational decisions and actions, tying that all together. You know, we work through self-talk, we go through, you know, the camera view, what they see and what really is happening or what we see. Um, we spend a lot of time with those things. So, yeah, it's, it's quite the, it's out of Chicago, uh, the DuPage County area. They, they've done some extensive research and different things. So it's really been, in my opinion, ties into with CPI extremely well. Because it is. It's about thinking and listening, hearing, and, and making future modifications. So 
we tied it all together really well. It's really helpful. Excellent. Now, you, my, you kind of got my attention when you said, well, now you came in in 2006 and CPI is in place. Maybe it's in place as a, you know, the training as people have been trained, but they're maybe not using the techniques and the behavioral models or they're not trusting them or involving them in their actual interventions. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, it, it was it was it was here. This is our process, but you know, it, it's kind of like you know, uh, I always equate it to kids being on a football team or something, where it's like, hey, we got a new coach; he's showing us something. Mm-hmm. We're gonna, but game time, we're gonna do our old stuff, right? You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so you know, it, it bothered me because I'm like, this is our culture; this is what we're expecting people to do, and it was kind of like, well, we're gonna go through the training, and I just felt like it was a, in my opinion, a uh, uh, staff were doing good things. A lot of it they were doing, they just didn't understand the connection. And then, uh, you know, there were some things early on when I when we, when we I started as an instructor that scared us a little bit that CPI was being taught with just the basic, simple in, interventions. And, and the problem was we're a detention center. We we have to manage people. We, you know, these kids come and attack staff. They go after other peers. And, and we don't, you know, there was a big discussion early on in my career about, you know, well, we'll have to take them to the floor. No, we're not taking them to the floor. Well, look, they ended up on the floor. Like, no, we didn't take them to the floor. The the, the kid resisted, and we ended up on the floor. Um, so we had some really hot debates on how to manage floor systems, which happened to be ironically the same time um, that CPI had opened the doors with the applied stuff. Uh, Marvin Sharp, I, I had a chance to get into a, one of my first trainings uh, as an applied system, and Marvin just opened up my eyes and kind of saved us from keeping because we were – I was really fearful. We didn't have a management system when we had to manage people, and it was, it was a little shaky for a while. Mm-hmm. So you had that in the applied physical skills in 2012, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, I yeah. believe that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm getting old, so. <laughs> <laughs> you and me, uh, I'm going right along with you on that. So, so now, Stan. So, I, uh, so you come in, and so how do you start to? So let's go back to that team idea where, well, okay, it all sounds great on the sidelines, but when you actually hit the the, the field, you actually go back to an older uh, paradigm of behavior management. How do you start to really get CPI training and the behavior models for people to trust that and turn to that as a, as a system to manage behavior? Well, I, I mean, I know one of the things that I dealt with coming in, it, we, you know, we're quote unquote, a, a, you know, some people refer to us as a correctional facility. Um, I, I really have stayed away from the negative mindset of problems, 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 stop them from doing this, stop them from that. So I, I, I really, my staff, I, I encourage them to, to, to support each other as opposed to finding flaws with each other. Um, that was step one because everybody was so worried about making mistakes that they weren't growing. They weren't, they weren't doing anything. They weren't, they weren't stepping forward. So really highlighted my staff and you know when they were doing things yeah you, you did a great job with this well i didn't do it perfect well this is part of the growth you know can we do it better next time and that's where the coping model came into it's like you did a good job here you know we, we need to improve on this spot instead of me writing everybody up and, and and making it scary to be involved in the process i really encourage people to partake in the process. I mean, we don't want to go through any physical restraint, but are you using the de-escalation? Do you recognize the anxiety? Do you do you use the um, the kite model? Do you see where this is all playing out to it? And and so once I made it more of a, a, a teaching effort, then it became like, okay, well, I can ask this guy some questions and I'm not going to get in trouble or, or those kind of things. So once that kind of started, it was a hard sell. But once people started buying in, and the people who were like, I might probably my worst skeptics, you know, they they put their foot out there and tried it, and I, and I remember one of them in the middle of a training, everybody's like, well, yeah, but yeah, but, and, and my worst skeptic stepped up and goes, look, clearly if we were doing something really wrong, we'd all been written up a long time ago. We got to start buying it. So that was one of my highlights of my getting culture change for my staff, and that was huge. So you start to see people trust the behavioral models and the de-escalation techniques. And um, you, you, in our pre-interview, you said that a lot of uh, the kids that arrive there are, are in the anxiety stage. Uh, oh. And so they're, they're, so they're coming in at a heightened uh, state of, uh, of uh, or they're, they're ready, they're closer to acting out than somebody just that you would meet on the street, let's say. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, st- does staff start to, so you start to feel this behavioral model take root in your staff then? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you know, as we start talking about it, I mean, you know, number one, we're a detention center. Nobody wants to go to jail. Right. <laughs> I, mean, sure. I mean, so you know, especially with a teenage kid who struggles with understanding how the how the world operates and how society and expectations, you know, these kids are coming off the streets, and so they've either had you know been taken from their home, they've been taken from their game plan for the evening. They're involved in some, you know, sometimes in some negative culture that they're involved with in the community. So then they've been pulled from that, and they know when they get out, they're going to get have to face that 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 dilemma. So our there's nobody comes to our facility wanting to be here, and so we spend, you know, our first part of our intake process is not getting into a power struggle with these kids. It's just really being supportive, and you know, knock on wood, our staff are phenomenal of going, hey, look, so and so's coming in. So let's, uh, you know, we always know they come in hot and, and let's help them out. Let's let's get things kind of cultured. Let's, we know this person is going to take 10 minutes to cool down a little bit. Or, hey, this staff member has a great relationship. If this kid walks in and says, hey, I, I just want to talk to this person, then you know what? We accommodate. That's that's part of our CPI process, you know, removing the targets and, and trying to incorporate what's going to work best for the individual who's close to acting out and keeping that acting out, that risk behavior as minimal as possible. Have you seen a commensurate uh, downturn in the, if you've seen restraint reduction, I guess is what I'm asking. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not even, a, I mean, for us, for being a 24-bed detention facility, mm-hmm. dealing with what we deal with, I mean, we, I, I don't know what our current numbers are, but we did a, a, a census about a, a year ago, and we were averaging anywhere from 14 to 20 physical restraints a year. And that's, and, and industry-wide for detention is, is very low. I mean, it's not uncommon in many industries to, or facilities to have two to restraint a day. And so our goal is is never to have a restraint. And, I, and people ask, well, but you have to manage. And I ask, I ask the people, my, my big thing with my staff is, I want you going home at the end of the day. Right. We don't hire people to be knuckle draggers or, or, or the enforcers. We hire you to build relationships. We have a very diverse population of staff. For a lot of reasons, and we want to connect with every kid we can. We we have cultural uh, differences as staff. We have uh, size differences. We have you know all the different spectrums of things you can run into in the staff. And people don't work with our population because they they're out to, uh, to prove a point. They're out to support kids. Excellent. So they come with open hearts, and and they they're not coming with a whole lot of you know physical restraint backgrounds and all this you know. Uh, physical management stuff. They come with great knowledge and, and social work knowledge and you know some CJ knowledge. And so you know we have a diverse group. So we have to get everybody on the same page. So I know that you you the training is mandatory there. I understand that you've also uh, taken training to other people in the county who have heard about CPI training. Yeah, um, you know, uh, for me as an individual, it you know I tell people this is human behavior. The, the CPI process is, is natural human behavior. Um, and so we, we, we took it, um, we expanded on it within our own detention center. We, we, uh, our court officers were some of our previous staff here got promoted on. And so that became some topics and they asked me to do a few trainings with staff just to make sure that, that they're working together. Cause I always incorporate the team concept as well. It's huge. And, and staff, you know, when you start getting into the different divisions, you know, the friend of the court and general trial and juvenile court officers, they're not necessarily in a secure detention center, but they visit places, they go to homes. And, and so we talk about, you know, if there's two people or if there's, there's an issue, how do you handle it when you're by yourself in the office? And so we, we, we expanded it to the juvenile court officers. And then that expanded into, we have a, an academy here in Ingham County where we have Several kids that uh, are, are it's like an alternative ed with treatment and everything in it. We expanded it to their staff because they were in the classrooms every day. Friend of the court, you know, obviously friend of the court in, in Michigan. And I would imagine other parts of, of the United States. That's 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 naturally a stressful environment, regardless. Nobody's ever happy when they go into friend of the court or when they come out. Um, and so they, we start talking about, you know, helping their staff understand some anxieties and understanding how to work through that kite model, because really. You know, when you're working with the court system, very few people come to court not having anxiety. So we really, really work with staff to understand how to how to keep themselves from getting into power plays, um, not, you know, not at the top of that uh, kite model, not pushing the, the temperature up a little bit. 
and uh, trying to understand that process. Just for some of our listeners, I yeah. want to make clear that that you're referring to the verbal escalation continuum, which is the which is has a kite diagram for the different stages of the verbal escalation continuum. Uh, I understand too that you guys have quarterly seminars that that uh, speak to the four stages of the crisis development model. Could you talk about that for just a moment? Yeah, yeah. A couple of years ago, when we were running into you know there was the the, the active shooter hot topic was 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 really heavy and. And so, you know, with the administrators in the county were like, well, we have a sheriff's department. We can show them what they, what they would do in their process. And, and then it, it also came out, well, how do we, we got into the discussion of like precursors, like how do you prevent this from happening? And so this is where the CPI, they came to me and said, Hey, look, can you do something? Cause you do a lot with that in your CPI training. So, you know, I spent some time with the staff at CPI. We came up with some just general topics. I do a two hour session. It's kind of like the two two seminars. One is the the precursor to it, and then the other one is the um, actual acting out situation. So I talk immensely about the anxiety stages of the continuum, and then I talk about we spend a lot of time in the in the two hour brief. People asking questions about how do we deal with things, and we talk about the kite model and and uh, dealing with people. And, and it ranges. I get people. It's countywide. I get people from parks, I get court people, I get people from accounting, I get people from receptionists. Meaning that, you know, this is one of the examples I had a receptionist lady came in and she's like, well, all I do is answer the phone, so I'm not really sure how this applies. And I said, well, let's get through the training and, and we talk. So we got through some things and got through the anxiety. She's like, well, everybody's stressed when they call me. I, you know, I can't remember exactly what she did. It was something to do with like she did uh answer the phone for the taxation department or something where it was like, she just said, here's your bill. kind of the deal. And I said, how does, how do your phone calls go? And she was like, well, you know, they call and did you ever get mad people? Oh, everybody's mad because I'm increasing taxes or I'm giving them the bad news. I'm not necessarily doing it, but I'm giving them the bad news. I said, do they argue with you? Oh, I argue all the time. And I said, well, how do you resolve your arguments? Well, I just hang up on them. I said, wow. <laughs> And I said, uh, I said, really? She goes, yeah. And so everybody kind of raised an eyebrow. And so I said, well, let's talk about that. She says, problem solved. I don't have to talk to him anymore. I said, but do you ever think that that's a, maybe a trigger that might send that person down to the library um, and shoot up the library or something? And she looked at me and she's like, uh, you know, never thought about that. So we spent some time and, you know, she started listening a little bit more. And we went on with the training and and move forward. And about two or three weeks later, I got an email from her saying, Hey, you know, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your candor with me. Um, I want to let you know that I've taken the kite model, uh, copied it, downsized it and laminated it. And I have it on my phone. So when I am in those situations, I make an effort to work through that kite model and bring people down to, to a basic level. So when I hang up, I, I have a better mindset that I know I didn't trigger somebody to do something. So that's kind of, we've incorporated that, that's built out that, that training seminar up for the county. That's a great example of how uh, you can take training and really make it part of your day-to-day. Uh, how you ch- deal with challenging behavior is based on a behavioral model that, you know, teaches you uh, empathy, understanding, patience, uh, and uh you mentioned that uh, you guys are down to maybe a couple dozen restraints in the space of a year. Yeah. So, so you really have a culture there where, where it has become truly a last resort. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, yes. And, and uh, it, it's, it's um, yes, I, you know, we, we're accommodating, you know, with the kids. Like, we recognize what works with kids. Our coping model helps us because our kids, well, our kids are frequent flyers. Okay. Um, and so if they come back, we already have an experience with them. So we really try to work through like, hey, we made a promise last time with the staff and we were going to do this, this, and this. Let's make sure we follow up with that. And, and so, you know, we get into that coping model and that's been huge for our kids and it's huge for our staff. Mm-hmm. So um, debriefing is important there then. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, for the first couple of years I did the CPI process when we started the instructor, it really focused on the beginning, the anxieties. And over the years, I was able to, uh, you know, tag into different topics. And one of the things that we ran into a few years ago was, was our staff were just not trusting the new staff. And oh. so, you know, it, you know, I got seasoned staff, great job. They just do things they don't think about and they move on. You got young staff coming in and, and either they're going to watch and watch and watch or they're going to overwork 
overdo too much. You know, they're motivated. So you get quite the diverse population. And so, you know, how do we get through that? Well, you know, we, we, we attacked the coping model with the staff. We spent, we, we, we went through the normal process with the trainings, but we really focused on the coping model because if you can go through the coping model, you, we recognize where people have anxieties or where people don't have experiences and, and, and if I'm working with somebody, I have to know my coworkers struggling today because they're going through a divorce, or I have to know that life is going on with these people, and not everybody's all in their A game every day of the week. So it was really good for us to push a professional piece as well because nobody would talk about things. I'm like, I get it. Not everybody wants to give their business out at work, but you know, if you come in and you're sore because you, you know, I don't know, tried a new sporting event last night for for trying to get away from your work stressors and you're not feeling good or you tweaked your knee, but you're still here, still functioning, then I have to know that you're not 100%. So I might step up a little bit more for you or you might step up for me or, you know, hey, you know, um, I get married this weekend. As much as I say I'm focused at work, I'm trying to think about what I'm going to do with my anxieties with, with, with the wedding. Sure, <laughs> sure. So we were able to really attack that, and we were able to build confidence with our staff, our, our veteran staff, to ask questions, to build future relationships in situations. Like, hey, you know, today you did some things. I didn't want to call you out in front of the kids because that wouldn't have been appropriate, but, but now that we have some downtime, let's talk about this. It really built that professional criticism, but yet constructive criticism for staff to work with each other. And with a focus on prevention, uh, as, as I hear you describing. And you said something to me, Stan, in our, in our pre where You said you talked about this, this, the way that staff communicate and the focus on prevention and uh, the communication, the coping model. But you also said this. You said ego is a killer in this process. Could you, oh, could you talk absolutely. about that for me? Oh, for sure. I, I stress that to me. To every training I do, ego is, is, is a killer. Ego has its place in our society. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of go a little bit here. You know, ego is, is that divide and conquer mentality. Ego is for uh, for sports teams. Like you're trained to have an ego to get on that field and go after everything and anything you can get. You know, law enforcement, they they have to have an ego. They, they, they're going out in our community and they're going to situations nobody knows what's going on. And they're putting their life on a line. So they have to have that ego piece because they got to go in, secure, make sure everybody's safe. And mobilize the threats and take care. So they go in it's that divide and conquer mentality. Same thing with our military. When they go in, they're going in. There ain't there ain't a whole lot of like, hey, let's talk about this. At that point, that's done. So in our environment, you know, you know, you go, you know, you go in and divide and conquer with a kid. That's that's game on for them. You know, some of these kids are like, oh, sweet, I got somebody I can challenge and, and see what I can get away with. And you know, there's the competition piece. So I tell staff, if you got an ego, you got to put it in check right quick. We all have it, but I'm not coming to work to get into, you know, battles every day. I'm coming to work to help kids. And when you're coming to help, ego is the piece that will destroy the health because you're not helping when you have an ego like that. And so we, we talk about how if your ego is in it, if I'm working with somebody and I have an ego going on and I'm in a power struggle with the kid and, and we're talking and, you know, we're in that, again, I go back to the kite model because that's one of my favorite tools. You know, I'm, I'm on... I got a kid who's refusing and I'm setting limits and then there's cursing and swearing at the top of that kite model. This kid's just just yelling and cussing and, and I'm doing the same thing. All I'm doing is turning the heat up. My ego is doing that. So when I can pull my ego back and go, okay, I'm going to sit back, let this kid say all the garbage he wants to say because I know it's just garbage. That's the difference with my staff. And I tell them, I said, if you can keep that ego in check, man, do you guys, and it does. I've watched young people come in with, with that, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do this. And they've come from a background of competition. And I, you know, I, I had a staff member a few years ago, a great kid, great job. I mean, phenomenal, motivated, studied, did everything. The minute something went down, he was like, I, his ego, you could just see his ego. Like, I'm the man. I'm going to do this. I'm going to prove to everybody I can do it. And I'm going to take care of this business. And so situation occurred. And, and so as I came in, I was talking to staff. We, we had some time. I always tell people time is on our side. We're a detention center. You know, we, we designated some people to be involved. And I asked the staff member, I said, you, you know, this new guy, and I said, you just need to take a break and watch. 
and, and it was like instant deflating. He was like, oh my God, you're not going to use me? I've got all these skill sets. I'm young. I'm athletic. I've got all these things. I'm like, no, I want you to watch and see the staff. And it happened to be some weaker staff, I guess, physically, if you want to talk strength-wise, um, but also some quieter staff. And we went in and, and uh, de-escalated this individual without any kind of physical intervention and, and got this kid to his room. And the kid just, and so I went back to the younger staff and he was like, wow, that's not how I was anticipating that to happen. That's that sports background. Go in and conquer and take care of it and drag them to their room or get them to their room, whatever it is. Um, and that's not how we want to operate with kids. And, and I tell people all the time, I want to operate like I would operate with my own kids. If I won't do it to my own kids, I don't want us doing it to them. I see. You know, you mentioned sports, Stan. I'm going to bring this in. Uh, Stan, you are a USA Wrestling Silver Level Certified Coach. Uh, you've got a reputation and a, a history of getting your athletes to perform at a high level. And I know you, you attribute part of your success uh, to by using part of the behavioral model process as a key ingredient in your coaching technique. Is, uh, absolutely. It's kind of ironic how this has all unfolded in my life. Um, I started volunteering as a coach just to give myself, again, we talk about rational detachment. <laughs> mm-hmm, right. <laughs> I, I leave our detention center with some kids who were very non-compliant and then go work with kids who say, hey, coach, what do you want me to do? All right, do 10 push-ups. How about if I do 500? So I got the motivation levels are completely different. But the general system, I mean, you know, as a coach, you're working with kids, parents. And, and, and when you go to a competition, they have anxieties. Like, am I going to do all the right things? I got all these things. Oh, this is the big guy. This is the guy. And so I support them. And then when I start seeing them kind of scramble and why, 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 I get a little firm with them. And I'm like, stop. That's the parameters for you. You're here to do this. You do what you can do. Here's your limits. You know what you can do. So I go from that anxiety. I watch and recognize that with the athletes, support them all the time. And then when I start to see them unravel or do something, I, I really pull in the, the de-escalation model uh, or the defensive model, uh, stage two, excuse me, I get mm-hmm. my terms messed up. That's okay. Um, and, and I work through that kite model and I, you know, the, the acting out piece really is the competition. It's that risk behavior that they have to take. You know, are they going to follow the program or are they going to do like a risk behavior and change up what they've been training so much to do because they're panicking? And then when it's done, after every match or after every competition, I sit down with the kids and I go through the coping model. What happened? What do you guys think? What do you remember? What was different today than yesterday? What were your triggers to change your performance? What made it better? What made it worse? And then as a coach, you sit down with your coaching staff and we, and we do the same thing. You know, how did, did we do what we needed to do? How do we make it better? What, what do we make changes for? What are our anxieties? What were the triggers? Why didn't Johnny perform? Or why did Johnny do better than what we expected him to do? And then we keep that culture moving forward. And that's very much in parallel with the way you would approach the behavioral issues you might see in the youth center. Absolutely. It's human behavior for kids. Right. They, they respond, mm-hmm. and you can never predict what they're going to do, but you can definitely, every kid has certain responses. Let's talk about behavioral triggers for a moment. I mean, I know that uh, you have a process by which you're able to, the triggers are very important uh, where, you, uh, where you work and that you have a process by which you're able to identify those. Could you talk about that, Stan? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, you know every kid comes in and out, um, but, you know, we have, you know, we, we work with kids. We, we're fortunate at the detention center, we get phone calls. Hey, look, so-and-so's got a background of this, such and such. Case workers are involved. But we, you know, when we talk about the triggers and different things, that you know, one of the examples I give is that we never know what those triggers are, but we always try to make note of when we have those experiences and how do we prevent those from happening. For example, I, I had a kid in, in our one of our day rooms, and I walked in. I didn't know this kid. I really had no clue who he was. I just walked in to say hi to the kids, and this kid started just completely freaking out. Um, and I was like, wow, this is this is not how I expected my morning to start. And I, I, clearly I was the target in regards to the trigger of the behavior. So I exited the room. I let staff deal with him. Again, keeping my ego in check because I could went over and said, hey, what's going on? Why are you doing this? But recognizing that I was the trigger because everything was calm until I stepped in, um, I left staff. And this is one of those communication pieces that our staff have. They know we, we check each other. And so, I, you know, afterwards, 
and the Zoom, and everybody was had the cold thoughts, and everything was calmed down. We processed. Staff said that you know you triggered him. And they're like, you didn't say anything, so we don't know what happened. Then I went down, spent some time with the kid, and said, look, I don't know what happened. Came out, I look like his stepdad that really seriously abused him. Oh. <laughs> so, you That's know, I'm like, trigger. hey, <laughs> you know, I can't change my overall looks, but let's talk about some things. And we came up with a little bit of a code. You know, I'd look at him every time I was walking to a day room, he'd give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Mm-hmm. If I got a thumbs down, I just left for a while and came back. You know, gave him a chance to deal with some of the anxieties and his coping models. Um, and so that was some triggers that we, you know, recognizing those things are huge. I see. You know, you also in our pre-interview, you said you, you're seeing more and more trauma caused by human trafficking. And uh, you also talked then about an, a tr- an event where there was a trigger. But could you talk to that, first of all, the human trafficking, uh, you know, victims that you're seeing, and then also the, the, the scenario where you had a trigger with one of, uh, a person that had endured trafficking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, trafficking kids have really become the forefront of some of our court systems. You know, our kids that have trafficked are, are kids who are out on the streets who are already running with risk behaviors and environments. So we have a, a, a court that really is starting to recognize and push forward on this trafficking and, and really big trauma care stuff, which is phenomenal because, you know, the example that I have is, is this case in point, we're a detention center. So, you know, before it was policy and procedure. Somebody acts out, they get this, this, and this, and this. It's just no, it's this policy, this, da, 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 da. This is our process, da, 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 da. And so we have these kids are going to school because we have a school system here. Young lady, you know, quiet, been trafficked, had, had tons of trauma. And our psychologist, everybody's working with her. She's in class. She's doing a really good job. Staff member goes over to help her with her homework, just leans over the table. What can I help you with? I don't understand. He leaned over, and all of a sudden, she just went bonkers. Wow. And to the point where it was, uh, you know, a 20-minute uh, physical management piece. I mean, she just went from zero to 160, like no business. And that, and so we managed her. We, we were able to get her de-escalated and, and get her taken care of. And once everything de-escalated, I processed the staff, and, and literally every staff was like, we, we – we are stuck. We do not know what the trigger was. She was doing well. We know what we, you know, we went through all the coping model, and they're like, we just cannot figure out this trigger. We don't know. Sometimes you can you can see the triggers, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a sidebar conversation, or they just came back from court or, or something. When this one, we couldn't figure it out. So, you know, you do your incident reports. Staff make recommendations of what they'd like to see with these kids in regards to the consequences or the accountability piece. You know, and, and normal process is if there's a physical restraint or acting out or assault, we have this reentry process that we have that keeps us away from keeping kids in lockdown. But anyway, so I go back to talk to the girl because, you know, you do your staff and then you process with the uh, individual who's acting out. The girl was very clear. You know, we start talking through things and she's like, look, Mr. Granger, when Mr. Such and Such leaned over the table and put his hands on the table, he is a big guy. That is exactly how my trauma started. Somebody leaned over the table with a deep voice and said, I'm going to help you, and this is what we're going to do to you. She goes, I had an instant trigger. It, and she goes, I apologize. I don't remember any of it. And it which goes case in point with trauma when they act out. A lot of them are just survival mentality. So, you know, as staff, we have to work through that and go, okay, is this really a deviant behavior or is this a trauma response? So. Going again, going through the coping model, bringing everybody's information together, and we talk to staff. And I'm like, "Look, would you do this to your own kid when they've been through this?" And they're like, "No, I'd like to see him get the help." Okay, so you feel like this is an acting out person, or is this a person who's responding because of their background? Their background. So that has helped my staff kind of reformulate when we do have acting out. It doesn't automatically mean, you know, discipline, discipline, discipline which is huge with the number of kids that are trafficked and with the number of our, have our population right now today is, is traffic kids. Um, and so you can't respond to those kids the same way disciplinary wise as you would other kids. So really it, it's a, it's your brand of trauma informed care. Yeah. I mean, we pull as much as we can and, and, and try to, you know, I was, I've been, I've been bugging the CPI people. I'm like, well, give me more trauma, give me more trauma stuff. Cause I want to incorporate it. We see it every day, and, and 
we're building it and it's just you know you can only build so fast but the nice thing is is i really contribute the the cpi process to help my staff how do i say it process through new things learn new things and keep an open mind to what's effective because you're ultimately trying to prevent things from happening in the future and so when you go through that coping model the therapeutic before you you're you're, you're problem solving and 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 that that not wasn't necessarily the case for a long time with the coping model. It was okay. That's not something that's huge important. Let's just manage the the, the behavior and get on to the next behavior. But you're using prevention as a foundational value very much in this. Yeah. This yeah. Mm-hmm. Constantly, constantly, and when staff come to me, I constantly ask them, "What do you think?" I want your professional opinion rather than, "Well, here's." This is what you told me, and this is what we're going to do. I want their opinion. They're there. They're involved with it. I'm not always in the forefront of what created a situation, so I have to hear what they say to get their thoughts and opinions. So would you describe debriefing as second nature now at uh, Ingham County Youth Center? Yes, yes. And, and you know, when I started, uh, as I was learning, you know, as an instructor, I was going through it, and I'm like, there are people in our building who are phenomenal with kids. Like, why are they so good and some of the other people really struggling with Again, they were doing some of this process naturally. We just didn't realize it was part of the CBI process. And so once we kind of got things pointed out, and I, we would ask the CBI class, I'd be like, who does great with kids? they like, such and such, such and such. And I'd be like, why? Because they talk to the kids. They figure out what's going on. Oh, well, let's talk about the CBI process real quick, the therapeutic report. Um, and so we started making cross examples, and that was huge for our staff, especially the new ones who are really trying to figure it out and really trying to, to build their A-game and, and really become staff members that they want to be it was huge. So how did they? How was that message delivered to them? Could you articulate that just a little bit for me, Stan? Uh, you, know, you know, as we do the CPI class, uh, first of all, I always, we've done some different things throughout the years with the class. So, I'm, you know, I have staff who've been here taking CPI just like me since you know, the 1990s. So we've all kind of understanding the CPI process. So we've had to do some creative things to get people to think. One time I had the class with with my support and my co facilitators We had the staff teach the class and give their own examples. Ah. Like we gave them a situation where I was like, okay, you guys have all done this. Yeah, we know that. We know the test. We know this. We know that. Okay, fine. If you guys know it all, then here's what we're going to do. We're going to randomly draw sections. You know, the kite model, the, you know, all the, the de-escalation. You're going to have to explain it to your coworkers. And so we encouraged an environment where they were correcting each other on a positive note. But, you know, somebody would get up and they're like, ah, I don't know if I know this. And then somebody in the crowd would be like, yeah, you do. We do this every day. We built that communication piece in the class. So I always refer to my classes. I don't want to be Miss Donovan from Charlie Brown. I don't want to be wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I think, who, and who couldn't relate that to their, yeah. their primary education? Yeah. Right. So I always encourage my staff to engage. I always tell them, stump the instructor, please, because mm-hmm. if, if you can stump me, then I got something I got to get better at. And you're pointing out points that I didn't think about. You know, that's interesting because that, that is such a pers- interpersonal, uh, you, you know, where the, the, the trainer um, becomes, I mean, the group becomes really critical to, the, to the, um, the way that the training is facilitated. But I know that in 2017, you became certified in our blended learning uh, option. Uh, what, do, you, do you guys use that at, uh, in Ingham County or is it all uh, classroom? Uh, we we're I've been kind of stead strong with the classroom piece, and not because I don't feel that the 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 blended learning works. It's just that for me, I'm able to. I mean, I get two days with staff. We're such a busy shift work facility that that it can give staff time away to really. I can focus on different topics each year. Like, what's our core topic with staffing, or what's our core topic in the building that we're struggling with, and so. I've been I've been a little reluctant myself to, to to do it, and it's not because of I don't think it's a good program. It's just that for my culture, it's our great. It's kind of like our retreat for the year. Like we're getting away and talking about issues and problems and incorporating CPI in that process. I've added to the the class um, in regards to topics. You know, hey, we we have suicides that have been going on all year long, like suicide attempts. I can incorporate some of that into the CPI. Like I did some role plays one year. I'm like. I did a situation and the staff, we walked through a whole role play and 
Um, I did like five of them in pig staff to be like mock our facility, what we do. And then I had the rest of the, the classroom would just watch. They responded, they debriefed, and then I got a debriefing from the people in the audience. But one of the things that I did was I threw in some suicide situations, which are not quite, you know, uh, you know, an acting out individual. So we really gave us some time to really twist the topics around a little bit and deal with some unexpected stuff that we've been dealing. So that's my only concern with the flex. Now, if I had, you know, 3,000 people that I had to train, you know, some of these hospitals that, you know, timing and training is this issue. I absolutely, I, I saw as I watched it in the training and, and heard people talk like, oh, this would be awesome. I can get some of the classroom pieces over with and really get into the, the nuts and bolts for each department. You know, my trainings, I have an isolated group of people for the most part. And for us, the I just think there's that bonding classroom time and we're able to do it. So if I'm able to do it, I really want that one-on-one with the class. I see. I see. Well, that well for the culture that you work in. I mean, and and the the, the behavioral challenges that you face. Like you said, there might be, you might have a uh, a, a jump in the incidence of suicide attempts. Um, that's something that's going to demand more of an intensive classroom focus and a really just a, a group sort of a discussion that that maybe, like you said, blended learning might be more appropriate if you've got a lot of staff to train and you're introducing uh, prevention as a concept, say. Uh, but when you really get into the specialized uh, population that you deal with, you're finding that that classroom portion, that retreat, if you, as you called it, is uh, the best way to impart the, the methodology and the concepts to the people that you work with. Yeah, yeah, we are exploring, and it, it, it came up... Uh, uh, because, you know, we want to use it. I mean, the tools that you guys are providing at CPR are just phenomenal. So we don't like them. We don't want to not use the tool. Um, and But we are looking at, we get we often get like subs that get hired in at, you know, different times, you know, and they come in and we, you know, it's not like we do like one hire in a year. When we have a group of people, we hire them as they come in as substitutes because, they you know, they come and go so much. Or new hires where like we do an annual training, but maybe a new hire might get the flex program initially. So they're familiar with the topic. Um, we just haven't quite been able to work out how to pull that trigger and make that happen. Um, but that's where we really see it as helpful. Somebody gets hired in in, in July and we already had our annual CPI training in June. You know, you're, you're going to be kind of untrained or at least unfamiliar with the process if we don't get you some exposure of a mini class. All right. Well, Stan, let, let me ask you to, to close today. Uh, what's, what do you think has been your greatest professional inspiration as you go in every day and you try to, you know, manage the, the center as best you can? You know, uh, kids are getting help. And, and I, you know, again, I think, you know, I've kind of summarized it throughout is that staff that I work with are really working with each other as opposed to, I've been doing this for a long time, you don't need to help me. I, we've created an environment of people who are willing to accept professional criticism, but also give professional criticism and not have that ego kick in and go, well, if you're going to do this, then I'm going to do that. I like working in a positive environment. Um, and our environment's very difficult to remain positive in because it's constant negative. People are constantly trying to find problems with kids. Well, they got this problem. I mean, the social workers come in, they highlight good things, but you know, they, these kids come with such a package of damage that, you know, you can't help but not look at it and go, wow, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem. We built this the token economy. We, we, we build on recognizing, I call them baby steps. And, and to be able to walk in and, and see this kid who's who's been cussing and swearing and refusing to comply for days and look at me and go, you know, and this is one of the things that happens. I walk by one of my more difficult rooms every day and this kid's just F-bombing me. I hate you. You're a Da, 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 bleep, bleep. And I walk by the next day, and, he, and he's, I hate you, you're rotten, you're terrible, da, 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 but there's no F-bombs, there's no bleeps. And I'm like, wow, that's a behavioral change, and that's a baby step. Uh-huh. So I reward them with our token system. We have a token for a change in behavior. You you know, it, they're like, well, he's still swearing at you. It, it, and I tell them, that's my ego. If I keep that up, that's not working. I saw some changes. A baby starts walking. And I, this is another one that I use. When the baby starts to walk, everybody gets excited. Baby walks two steps, they get extremely excited. Walks five steps, they quote, you know, snap, you know, videos, and everything like that. All of a sudden, now the baby walks two steps the next day and falls down. I don't know of anybody that yells at the baby 
and get to the baby's grill because he fell over the, the, and didn't do five steps they should have done the day before. So, Excellent. You know, mm-hmm. and so that's how I, I operate. And the kids have to come from a, a damaged environment. They've been traumatized some way. we got to help them move forward, but not setting a standard that they're not willing to grow into yet or able to. So, Well, that, that is inspirational. I think uh, any, anyone who deals with uh, any kind of challenging behavior, whether it's in your own family, whether it's at work, uh, recognizing progress is incremental and looking uh, on the uh, taking a positive attitude uh, towards behavioral change and improvement is uh, really fundamental, I think, towards the culture change that you've been able to achieve there at Ingham County. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's huge. I mean, it, like I said, we come in working to help kids, not looking to find problems on kids. I mean, there's, well, we still do it. We got to be aware of it. But I don't operate in the fact that I'm just spending time finding problems. I operate on how are we helping this kid become better. I see. Well, that's a great thought to to, uh, to close today, Stan. I want to thank you for joining us today. My guest today has been Stan Granger. He is a Youth Center Supervisor at the Ingham County Youth Center in Lansing, Michigan. He is also a Master Level CPI Certified Instructor. Stan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. And thank you all for listening. Thank you for joining us today on Unrestrained. Tune in again soon for another interview with an expert in behavior management. Until then, this is your host, Terry Vitone, hoping your intention is prevention.